Welcome. My name is Michael McDonnell. I am the cybersecurity librarian. Thank you for joining me for this technical Tuesday about honeypots. Um, so in our last technical Tuesday, which was held in the discord, um, Jason presented his home lab, which integrated, um, honeypots managed by anomalies, um, modern honey network with Splunk. And he gave us a tour of his lab and its architecture and the hardware and some of the things you could do. And it really seemed like a great idea would be to go in depth um, on how to deploy a honeypot and what you can do with it. And it just so happens, um, I've got a lot of experience with a very particular honeypot. It's a favorite of mine. Um, so tonight, I'm going to give you an introduction and a little bit of advanced tutorial on Cowrie. Cowrie is an SSH honeypot. So um, it emulates a Linux server. The hackers break into it and we get to record everything they do. And that is super cool. Um, I'd like to give, uh, so, uh, let me tell you what I'm not going to do. And then I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. So, um, not going to tell you how to install Cowrie, not going to show the analytics. So last week, Jason gave us a bit of a tour, both in Splunk and in the elk dashboards that, um, are very popular with, um, Cowrie and other honeypots. Not going to cover that. Uh, what I am going to do is two parts. Part one, I'm going to explain what a honeypot is and what this particular SH, SSH honeypot is and how you'd use them, the kind of data you could get and why that would be valuable. Give you the background. If you've never heard of honeypots, never used one, um, those concepts will be helpful for you. And if you have used honeypots, maybe you want to learn a little bit more about this one. And then what I'm going to do, you know, so that'll take like half an hour or something. Um, and all the while I'm going to show you um, a honeypot I set up a week ago. We're going to explore the data. Then I'm going to show you a little bit about real practical uses of this honeypot and some of its advanced capabilities. Because there are ways to customize this, to emulate virtually any sort of um, Linux-based or SSH-based target you'd want so that when the hacker interacts with it, they really feel like they're interacting with the target you want them to. And so you can capture real behavior. And I'll show you a little bit about how that is because with this honeypot, it's really easy. Um, and um, mostly what I really want to do <laughs> is play around with the data I've collected and look for a few cool things. Uh, I've been running SSH Honeypot since at least 2010, and I have caught some amazing attacks. Back in the day, I caught all sorts of interactive hacking attempts from Romania. Um, made me fall in love with this Honeypot. So I'd see all sorts of password guessing but I kept seeing connections to my honeypot from Romania. And the Romanians had a very particular pattern of activity. They would log in and they would check to see what type of CPU the system had, how much RAM it had. They download a very large file, usually um, a Windows NT service pack. And I think they were measuring bandwidth. And Maybe sometimes they'd install a piece of software that would then go and do the exact same attack against other stuff. Sometimes they wouldn't. But what was amazing about these attacks is there was very clearly a human there that was using a semi-automated process. And you would see them typing commands and typing them wrong. And you'd see them change directories, type it wrong, and they'd run a command and clearly not know they're in the wrong directory. So the person at their end 
obviously didn't know what they were doing, but I would see these over and over and over. And I came up with this theory that someone must be running some sort of sweatshop or call center based on cybercrime. Uh, and my theory was that they were password guessing these servers and then enumerating them for what resources were there and probably selling them on the, or access to them, selling access to them on the dark net. Years later, I saw a documentary. Oh my God, that was actually happening. And I was able to deduce all this just from intelligence gathered from my honeypots. Um, and even now that I don't run them 24 seven, I like to set them up once in a while and just see what sorts of attacks are common today uh, and how things are changing. And tonight we're going to do a little bit of that. Uh, okay. Um, so let's start at the beginning. Um, a honeypot is a fake system, usually a fake system that's designed to attract an attacker. And the idea of the honeypot is we're going to lure the attacker in and then we're going to monitor everything they do so that we can learn lessons. Uh, some honeypots are specific to a type of application. Um, there are honeypots that pretend to be industrial control systems. Uh, there's a very well-known um, WordPress honeypot that's designed to look like a vulnerable WordPress site and um, capture the behaviors of WordPress attackers. Um, things that we typically do with honeypots is we will, um, first of all, learn the IP addresses of the attackers. Not bad. Make a block list. Um, in the case of uh, a honeypot that requires authentication, like the SSH honeypot we're going to use, we get to gather all of the usernames and passwords they're trying. So which passwords are in use by real world attackers to brute force login attempts? We get to learn that. Um, in this type of honeypot where the hackers can actually interact with the system, um, the hackers will log in and attempt to download malware. We get copies of the malware. Then we can reverse the malware, figure out what it does, um, make new virus signatures, capture the hashes. But not only that, we get the URLs that they're hosting the malware on. Again, valuable for block lists. Um, this type of uh, honeypot we're going to use is very interactive. The hackers log in and it simulates an SSH command line on a Linux system. They type in commands. We get to learn their techniques. What are they trying to do? Are they downloading? Um, in the old days, they download um, IRC clients or IRC servers that would act as command and control, or in some cases, um, were DDoS programs, and they were just logging in and launching DDoS. I've heard that today, they often download um, coin miners, trying to exploit the computing resources get to learn all of the techniques, what's really going on in the wild. And, um, you know, the more we customize the system to be the honey trap, we can sort of affect what type of attacker would be attracted to this system. So I like to sometimes name my honey pots off, off of things that um, might indicate what they are supposed to be. So sometimes I name them after financial systems, um, call them SAP, whatever. So see if the attacker is attracted to that. Or in some case, I use names that would indicate maybe there's some Bitcoin wallets. Um, and I'm hoping to draw them in to explore the system a little bit more so I can capture their tools, techniques, tactics, practices, procedures. Um, see if they'll download more malware, that sorts of thing. Um, that's honeypots in a nutshell. This honeypot is special. So um, let me share my screen. So we're using a honeypot called Cowrie, and it's a descendant of an older program called Kippo. And it's a Python program that pretends to be 
first of all, an SSH server. And then second of all, once you log in via SSH, it pretends to be a Linux system. And it's highly customizable. And when you interact with it, you can run real commands. So rather than talking about that, let me show you a little bit of a demo. So what I'm going to do here, so we're going to go over here, and we're actually going to connect to my honeypot. So here's what I've done. Um, I went over to DigitalOcean. If you haven't heard of DigitalOcean, they're a really great Linux hosting platform, cloud platform. And you can buy a thing called a droplet. It's a pun on DigitalOcean. Um, the smallest one, $5 a month. And that's what I usually use my honeypots on. And you can pick data centers around the world and you can pick whatever Linux OS you want to run. And so I've created an Ubuntu instance, uh, paid my five bucks, and it's running uh, Cowrie. And if I log on to port 22, I'm not interacting with that Ubuntu server. I'm interacting with the Python program Cowrie instead. Mm -hmm and it will emulate an actual SSH interaction and pretend to be Linux. So I'm gonna to connect to it. And at this point, it's like, okay, it says, okay, login is root. And now as the attacker, I have to guess the password. And what I've done with my, you, there's a lot of ways you can set this up. So you can set it up so that it'll accept any password and just let them in. Um, that's a great way to harvest all the usernames and passwords. I've set it up so only certain passwords work. So I'm going to type in uh, Huawei. And boom, now I'm in. Because that I, I know the passwords I've configured. And it looks like it's a server called Server04. It looks like it's a Debian server. So far, it looks normal. Um, hey, let's pretend we're those Romanians from 10 years ago. And let's look at the proc file system. For those of you who know, don't, don't know Linux, proc is a really old Linuxism where you can look at the kernel internals, the hardware information, all as if they're files. And so I'm going to go and take a look at the CPU info. And it says, okay, you've got uh, two CPUs, Intel Core Duos, E8100s at 2.6 gigahertz. This does not exist. These CPUs don't exist. Kauri is letting me, when I say cat proc CPU info, Kauri is interpreting what I'm, I'm doing and then pretending to do exactly what would happen if I ran this on a Linux system. And this is very reasonable output. So when I was an attacker, I'm like, okay, I got this system. Uh, let's see who's logged on. I can type the who command just like I could in Linux. And it's like, oh, here's this guy logged in. And this is just me. That's that's all that's, that's here. One user, the load average is zero. Okay, um, what processes are running? Okay, again these processes aren't running. They don't exist. This is a completely fake system, but this is compelling output. So as a hacker, I'm like, oh, so, okay, there's a DHCP client running, uh, RPC, at and cron. It's got systemd, our syslog. So far, it looks like a stock Debian system. Uh, Oh, look, VirtualBox. Oh, that's interesting. The VBox service is running. Erlang, Beam, I don't know what that is, but again, those aren't actually running. But as an attacker, I'm now compelled. Now, I can do some cool things here. So as an, you know what I can, you know what the first thing an attacker is going to do is he's going to log in, he's going to download some scripts maybe to do privilege escalation, give himself some more privileges. I'm root in this case, it doesn't matter. Uh, or download some malware. And uh, let's let's go download something. Let's go download, uh, let's go download the cyber, oh. 
Well, now. That was unexpected. Let's download the cybersecurity librarians. Cyber library. I don't even know how to spell my own website. Librarian. I picked the wrong profession. You know, librarian is hard to spell. Um, let's download the homepage. And it connects. And it's waiting a response. I think I spelled that right. It should actually work. Here, let's uh, let's download something different. Oh, it won't let me quit. Uh, I'm going to come back to this part later, but the really cool thing about this honeypot is anything the attacker attempts to download will actually be downloaded, but not made available to the attacker. It downloads a copy for me in the logs so I can see what they did. Now, what's really cool is when you download a file, so you download a tar file or a zip file, when the attacker interacts with the system, it's, it's going to um, show in the file system that he downloaded it. In this case, it's not working because it, it's hung up. I'm just gonna duplicate the session and we'll start over. Let's do this. Hmm. Not sure why this doesn't work. This might explain why I don't have more than four malware samples right now. Um, now, you can also explore the system and you can look and you can, just like you went on Linux, say ls slash bin. And it says, oh, you've got all these commands. And uh, I could say which um, uh, bash. And it'll say, oh, bash is in bin bash. I could say run bash. And it's like, okay, I ran bash. Some of these commands like tail, oh, tail works. Or does it? Many of the commands that are built into Cowrie are very clever and very interactive. And that's, by, that's on purpose. That's to trick the attacker. So for instance, if I downloaded a tar file and I said tar-xf file.t, Right now it's going to say, hey, there is no such file. Say find slash, normally that would run the find command and list all the files. And it's saying, no, you don't have that. Um, if I were to run tar on a real tar file I downloaded, it would actually list the contents. Because when I download it through Cowrie, it will really download a copy not truly make it available. The hacker can't run the malware, but it will let him examine the contents to convince him that it's there. That part's amazing. Um, one, of the, one of the most satisfying things is when you get a real human hacker and they spend a lot of time interacting on the command line and exploring your system, trying to run their software. But if they download stuff, right, if I go over here and I try to say, uh, let's run Zgrep, 
Oh, look what happened. Command not found. But wait, it's there. If Cowrie doesn't come with some code to emulate a command, it gives you a random error. And some of the, those random errors are really quite, um, quite cute. And so I've watched hackers download their malware and attempt to run it over and over and over and over while they're getting errors going, ah, segmentation fault, core dumped, but it works everywhere else where I hack. And <laughs> um, they can be quite frustrated here. But many of the commands actually do work or pretend to work. Like, is that the correct time? Well, every time I run time, it increments. But again, there is no actual Linux system here. It's interesting that it dies so quickly. Don't know why that is. Okay, so I've logged in as a hacker, run a bunch of commands. Now here's my next favorite part. So this time I'm going to log in as an administrator. So I'm not, I'm not logged into Cowrie. I'm actually logged into the Ubuntu box on which Cowrie is running. So if I, this is real. So you'll see here's, here's the Cowrie code running on this real box. Now, every single thing that happens when people interact with Cowrie is logged. So if we look over here, here's the Cowrie log. And there's all those connections that I had that were closing. And we can also see, um, you know, here are different clients logging in. And if we back up, we can see, you know, them um, initializing the connection, trying to log in with normal password authentication, which in, if you're not familiar with SSH, SSH supports a lot of ways of authenticating. You can authenticate with a public key. You can do null authentication or none authentication, which means you're just allowed in, or you can provide a password. And there's a special mechanism called keyboard interactive, which is another form of that and then you know eventually it says okay this guy's allowed in but when we successfully log in to Cowrie it creates what's called a TTY log TTY is um, a teletype terminal it's the terminal that we entered our commands on and what's really really cool here is it doesn't just record what I typed. It records everything I typed as an attacker, all the responses generated with the same timing. So we can play it back like it's a video. And if you get what I'm saying, you're giggling right now. Because that means we can play this back and see exactly what the attacker saw. So... Let's take a look at some of these. So here's a big one. Here's the size. Here's another big one. Let's play one of these back. And this is probably the one I just executed. So Cowrie happens to come with a uh, playback command. Our lib Cowrie TTY. And then this. Now, as soon as I hit enter, it's going to play back the session, everything that was typed from the moment of logon. And there you see ls bin. And if the hacker makes a typo, you see the typo. If the hacker is a really slow typer, you see the slow typing. This stuff blows my mind. And this was the example that I was just showing you moments ago.
Now, let's have some fun. Let's take a look at some of the ones that weren't me. And before you get your hopes up, I'm going to tell you something. I found that in the last five years, more and more and more, like when I say more, 90% of the attacks are automated. You will, I rarely ever find a human being interacting with the system. And even when I do, they quickly log in, find out that it, the system won't do what they want. They encounter one of those weird errors because they're trying to run a, a program that doesn't exist in Cowrie, and then they leave. Um, and so it becomes a little unsatisfying, not like my Romanian examples from 2010. So what we're going to do here is we're going to sort these by size. Uh, that's not by size, Michael. That's by size. Okay. So the ones on today, the 16th are me. This one is not me. This is yesterday. So let's check out what this guy did. 11K, it's not a lot, but it's more than these little... These ones here are like individual commands. So in playlog var lib calry tty. Oh, that's a human. You see that? <laughs> Interesting. He's not even waiting for crap. So you see this command up here that he typed NC traditional, that's netcat. Um, um, if you've ever done any pen test training, um, netcat is your friend if you wanna create reverse shells out of nothing. Um, netcat will connect to network connections or to sockets on system etc. Um, Jeremy asks, what about those files you downloaded with wget or curl? I can't remember. I'm going to show you that in a second. And I'm going to show you some samples I uh, already caught um, uh, that are more interesting than what I downloaded. So uh, I can play all of these things back. Take a look at another one. What's the next biggest one here? What's this guy? Oh, that's today. That's probably me. How about that one on the 10th? And play log var lib calorie ti. This is tiny. So this would probably go by in a split second. Oh, one of those. So I see tons of this. Um, so this is automated. So you'll notice that the minute it hits, like, so here's where the playback starts, right? Right here. That's me typing the play log command and everything else is recorded and there's no delay. It just immediately, boom. He's downloading this and he gets his file and it saves it here. And then he tries to run it. Actually, he tries to ch mod it. Now you'll notice that there's no interaction. You don't see him typing the command wget. And that's because SSH has two ways to work. When you're running SSH, you can do this. SSH hostname command. And it will log into the host called hostname and run the command called command. And you don't have to interact with it at all. And that's what this guy's done, is he has literally created a program that brute forces a whole bunch of IPs with a whole bunch of passwords. And then when it logs in, he's running this command with no interactive shell. Now, what I did was I used putty and I created an interactive shell and I typed a whole bunch of commands. And, that, and so this guy has sent a series of commands um, through a non-interactive shell. If you don't know SSH, you don't know Linux, that might not sound, that may not make sense to you. 
Um, but that is actually the main use of SSH is you're not supposed to SSH into a server and interact with it. You're basically supposed to automate everything and basically queue up all the commands you want and then get the results on your screen. So this guy was trying to download this, then change the permissions so he could execute it and then run it. And of course, Calry will download it, but it won't let you actually run it for real. So let's go have a look at what this guy downloaded because Calry saves all of that. So if we go into var lib Calry download. Here is all the stuff that has been downloaded. And these, these temp files, Jeremy, this is, this is what I was trying to download. And for whatever reason, it failed to download. So we got these, these temp files. But this and this and this and this, that is stuff that was actually attackers downloading it. And if we, so if you know Linux, the file command will identify the type of a file. So what I'm going to do is save varlib calorie downloads and look at the type of file. So this one is a 64-bit Linux executable. Oh, now this is interesting. This one, somebody downloaded a public key. I'll explain why an attacker would do that in a second. And then these two are... 32-bit executables. Now, what I find really interesting here is these two have the same number of bytes, but this is the hash of the file. This is its checksum. So they are different binaries, but with the exact same length. So think about that for a second. Why would that be the case? Why would you have two different binaries that are different Coming from attackers, same length. Well, they're obfuscated in some way. They've been mutated in some way. And, you know, there's, they're probably the same malware. Now, here's a really cool, cool thing about um, Cowrie. When it saves the file the hacker downloads, the, it doesn't give it the original name. We saw the original name was this. It gives it the hash, which means we can jump over to virus total. And we can go to the search page and we can paste in that hash and see if it's been seen before. Hey, and no surprise. This has been seen before, and most of the malware engines know that it's some kind of Linux Trojan. Some of them say it's a DOS program, and that's not shocking. Um, one of the most common uses of hackers breaking into these Linux systems is to DDoS other things. And in Virus Total, we can go and see what if there's anything interesting about it. Not really a lot of details. Um, this is the URL that it tried to contact. And what does the community say? Uh, oh, yeah. So lots of these samples were downloaded from the exact same place. Now we might at this point be wondering, oh, well, where did he download it from? Well, different IP address than what was seen in those other samples. But a really cool thing is separate from the repository of downloaded files, and separate from the captured log of the interactive shell, there is a rich log of everything else. So if we take a look at var log calorie calorie log, um, 
every single SSH connection with its cryptographic properties is all logged, including the IP address it came from. Now you'll see this strange syntax here. For those of you not familiar with IP version six, oh, I wanna say something snarky like you should be familiar with IP version six. This at the beginning means, oh, this is an IPv4 address. Um, and my honeypot runs both IPv4 and IPv6, um, which means pretty much hackers from the US and India can attack me. Uh, those are the two countries with the highest IPv6 uptake. Um, now, every time someone tries to log in, it'll say, oh, we've started the authentication service, and then someone's trying null authentication and it fails. Then they're trying password authentication and they tried guest guest, username guest, password guest, and I let them in. Um, it'll also say that, hey, when they logged in, we emulated this. And I'm gonna come back to that in a second. That's sort of an advanced feature of Cowrie is we can, with a single co configuration, emulate all sorts of different Linux hosts. Now, when they actually try something, so um, when they download something, the actual commands they sent are logged in here. And it doesn't matter if those are interactive or non-interactive, they're all logged. This isn't a command per se. This is actually a port forwarding request. One of my favorite uses as a sysadmin for SSH is port forwarding. It means I can create an SSH connection to a remote host and then tunnel TCP connections from my local host to the remote network. And this is useful for me. It's like a VPN. It's useful for me as a legitimate systems administrator. But for an attacker, it allows them to use the system they've broken into as cover so they can attack something else and it's gonna to appear to come from the hacked server. And this was the guy attempting to forward his requests to this web server, so port 80 on this. And then what he did is when he was trying to send to this web server the command, and this is if you have to be able to speak HTTP to understand this, but he was trying to get this URL and he passed in these HTTP headers and he said, oh no, I'm a, I'm a regular browser um, and I've got the PowerPoint plugin and the MS Word plugin. I'm just a regular old browser and I was referred to you by CNN. And so it looks like a normal request from a normal browser. This is one of the most common techniques I see SSH being used for is trying to um, attack other web servers. There's another request down here. So here we see another um, connection request, but it's going to this server on port 587. Hey, pop quiz, what's port 587 for? Whoever guesses 587 real quick gets a hero biscuit. Port 587 is for SMTP clients. So this dude is a spammer. He's trying to connect or he's trying to break into email accounts. Um, either one of those two things but he's probably trying to relay. Um, yeah, Jeremy says, uh, Google says it's the mail submission port. And so it's like port 25 for SMTP, except it's a different port in the original standards and it's designed for SMTP clients to submit their messages to be sent via SMTP as opposed to server to server. And Ryan says, oh, it's secure SMTP. Most often today it is secure and there is another port. Uh, if you wanna look like a smarty pants, 
tell me what the other port is. It starts with four. Um, and it is also a secured SMTP port. Anyways, this guy is a spammer. Straight up. What else do we got here? Oh, this one's interesting. So here we have someone going to an HTTPS website, port 443. This is its address. But then you see all of this. So this is all Unicode and uh, encoded. And you'll see embedded auth.riotgames.com. I am going to guess that this guy is attempting some form of attack against that server. In fact, here's a fun thing to do. Let us prep for HTTP log calorie log. And uh, one, two, three, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. All right. So what I'm going to do is try to print out the sixteenth field out of logs that have these um, connection requests. And then I'm going to just show all the unique values. Uh, actually, let's uh, let's do a little long tail analysis on this. Sort unique dash C. Um, for those of you new to Linux, what I'm doing is basically cutting out the name of the URL that they're requesting, the host name, from my log files. Then I'm going to sort uh, sort it then I'm going to only retain the unique values, but I'm going to count them. And then I'm going to sort it numerically so that we can see what the most popular website being attacked is. Uh, oh, lots of porn. Lots of Google. Interesting. And the most popular one being attacked is this thing. Don't know what that is. Oh, some API. That would be interesting to investigate and find out what that is used for. And, you know, we could go back in the logs and get the full URL that's being requested there and find out not just the host name, but, okay, so what was the URL they were requesting and what does that URL do? Um, uh, I would guess the reason for all the porn is actually money laundering. Um you're not familiar with it, but basically the online porn industry is a giant um, global hundreds of billions of dollar money laundering um, facility. Um, the same people own the sites as own the ad networks and they get to control how it's accounted for. It's uh, quite the racket. Um, I'm surprised there isn't more Amazon, but then again, maybe that. Oh, now here's another thing, is the port numbers. How many of these, so now that we've sorted all of this, let us, uh, oh, that's not quite what I wanted this lock and then just print the port number So mostly port 80, some port 443, so mostly web, but a lot of port 555, which is kind of interesting. 
that could also be interesting to look through and see what they're doing on port 445. Now, one of the other things I like to do with Cowrie is harvest passwords and build lists to find out what passwords are really being used. And um, to do this usefully, what you do, you have to do is sort of sort through your attackers. Um, so normally what I'll do is I'll write a little script that'll go through the log and then say, what passwords did a particular IP address try? And then make a list and then see if other IP addresses tried the same lists. And you'll find that certain lists get used over and over and over, which is usually a sign that there is a botnet or some kind of worm that is using the same list. And in the past, what happens is the attacker hits your SSH server and keeps trying different usernames and passwords from its list till it gets one, it logs in, downloads a copy of its the same malware that attacked you, and that malware will come with a list of additional IP addresses to attack, and then it sort of spreads like a worm attacking more and more and more systems with the same password list. Um, but you can, you can figure out who the threat actors are, who the bots are, what the malware is from the password list using the password list as a signature. Let's have a little, little look at uh, what's popular in passwords today. Um, so, Now, these, I'm just going to refer to my notes here. So what we're going to do is we're going to grep in the logs for trying off. No, no, it's not trying off. Uh, that will tell us the, the authentication method, not the username and password. Ah, login attempt. Login attempt. Now, when I'm trying to um, use the honeypot to um, determine real world password lists that are in use, um, I don't care if they succeed. In fact, I have set up honeypots before that never, ever, ever allow a log on. All it does is let them connect via SSH and keep trying passwords because what I'm trying to do is harvest the username and passwords they're using look for patterns and see if that can tell me anything. Um, and for some attackers, their scripts are naturally going to stop the minute they get one right. But believe it or not, I've encountered lots of attackers on these honeypots that they don't stop brute forcing even once they get one username and password right. They just keep hammering on you. And if you configure your honeypot to allow any username and password. Basically, they sit there day and night logging in, logging in, and never running any commands, um, which is quite hilarious to watch. Um, so let's take a look at log, And you'll notice here there's the username it tried, and there's the password. There's the username root, the password Dennis. Username Vasily, password Vasily. Username guest, password guest. And the last thing in this line is whether they succeeded or failed. Um, I'm quite fond of allowing guest and guest because in my own career doing security assessments, guest and guest seems to work for a lot of web applications and databases, or at least it has for me. Um, so let us parse some of this out. So, and we want field number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I want six and ten. Oh, counted wrong. Three, four, five. Oh, I see six, seven, eight, nine. Eight. 
Now, let's just strip this out a bit. Uh, let's do a little bit of magic here. Get rid of all this cruft that we don't want. Don't want that character. Don't want that character. And we don't want the quotes. Where it's not, I've got a syntax error of some kind. Oh, maybe I need to do this. No. Oh, I need to do this. Well, I'm just embarrassing myself at this point. what I'm doing wrong here, but I'm just going to skip that and I'm going to parse it the easy way. Parse that and then we're going to print number one and we're going to print number two. Oh. I have a syntax error here somewhere. And it's further up my command line. If anyone can see my syntax error, please let me know. So let's go grep, login attempt, bar log cowrie, cowrie log, talk, dash f, number one, print number two. Oh, now it works. But I needed to cut out one more piece, which is and I believe that was field number nine. There we go. Oh, now I know why my said command didn't work. Because this other thing didn't work. So we can fix that. So now that we've got all those, let us just look at the usernames first. And let's sort those, count up the unique ones, see what we got. Uh, so guest is the most popular by a long shot. Followed by root, no surprise, admin. If you're breaking into um, IoT devices, embedded devices, that's going to be the one you're going to hit. Now, this is a bit of surprise. Oh, our studio server. Okay. Oracle, manager. Don't know why Hubertina. If you've got a theory, let me know. Copy, user, supervisor. Ooh. Uh, they might be looking for industrial control systems with that. Yeah. Nagios. Yeah. Um, administrator. Now that's a funny one because this is really, really common in, um, windows systems, but not really common 
in other things. Um, Zach, Zoya, Xerox. Uh, yep, this is really common for Linux-based web servers. WebLogic, um, popular enterprise web application system, VNC servers, Vasily. Now, oh, interesting. So now you look at this and go, why would we see these? Well, um, it's common, not super common, but it happens that one group will know the usernames and passwords used by another hacking group. So they'll log in, they'll break into a server, maybe they'll have to do a privilege escalation, they'll create new accounts of their own to maintain persistence. Now here's the thing, we set up a honeypot and we're able to capture their malware, we're able to ana analyze it, we're able to capture all the commands they run. Well, the hackers can do that too. And then they can gather the techniques and the indicators of compromise from their competitors. And now they can go around going, well, we know that somebody else is creating a botnet and the login name's TSBot with a particular password. And then they can go harvest their competitor systems. It's a thing. Uh, TeamSpeak servers, interesting. Samba servers. Uh, porno, interesting. That seems to be the theme of the hackers today. Um, Minecraft, no surprise there. Uh, math. Hmm. That's an interesting one. Almost random, eh? Oh. Well, it's a sign of the times. Uh, guest 01, guest admin. Oh, capital Goober. Not all SSH servers are Linux servers. And not all of them care about case. So capitalization is interesting. Or that could just be some password list. Um, oh, that's interesting. Very interesting. Now let's do the same thing with passwords. Most popular password was guest. That's interesting. Lots of passwords ending in one, two, three. Maco one, two, three hacker. Uh, someone's using the rock you top 10 list. Huawei, Huawei. Uh, lots of top 10 patterns. No surprise there. Uh, 888 is a top 10 pattern right now. Um, don't know why. Hasn't been in past years. Zabbix servers. Uh, interesting. They're using passwords that are based on Chinese names. Um, root, QWERTY. Some more top 10 patterns. Amazon. Oh, did I see China Telecom? China, China. Yeah, there's an overrepresentation of um, Asian names in the passwords and representations of Huawei and of China. Hmm. That is interesting. Um, not quite sure what conclusion I would draw, but um, that's the purpose of having these honeypots is to gather this data and then begin to analyze who is doing what. Um, okay, so that's what you would do with the honeypot. But, and so now you can gather all this information. You can see what they do, get their malware samples, get their password lists, look at their techniques, see what URLs they're trying to use. That's pretty cool, and it's useful. Um, 
one of the things you might want to do is if you deploy, if you've got servers exposed to the internet, you might want to take one of your spare IP addresses or an IP address that's already used for another service. Say you've got um, a, a web server running on HTTPS port 443 legitimately used in your company and it is a critical application with high value information. What you might want to do is take your firewall, set up a honeypot on a um, protected segment, set up Cowry, and then redirect port 22 from that web server's IP to the Cowry server. Why? Because to the, the attacker does not know. All the attacker sees is that IP address, right? So you've got www.mycompany.com and now you expose a fake port 22 at that address and you can use it to see which usernames and passwords they are going to attempt to brute force. Why would you do this? Well, the random worms are going to use password lists that are completely unrelated to you, your company, your applications, and your data. But if someone at some point does a targeted attack against you, you will see something very different. You might start to see in the SSH attempts, usernames that reflect real users or applications in your organization. And then you should pay attention to the sources of those attacks. You could even start to get some more advanced intelligence by setting up the honeypot to let them in and see what they would do or create some elaborate series of honeypots and find out who's targeting you specifically. Um, what I want to show you now is I want to spend about 15 minutes explaining how you would customize Cowry to do some advanced things because this, and this blows my mind, it is so easy. So when we started, I showed how we would interact with it, what the attacker would see. It looks like a Linux system. And we could type ls and see um, listings of directories and some of the commands appear to have output. And so this is brilliant. Um, Cowry has a few components, one of which is called the Honey FS on my screen. And I'm not, I'm logged into the actual host on which Cowry is running. And so I'm seeing the files that make up um, Cowry's code. And in the Honey FS folder, there's an ETC folder and a proc folder. Now remember when I originally showed you the attacker's point of view, the first thing I did is I went and I said, cat proc CPU info. Well, guess what? CPU info is just a text file. If I want to make my honeypot look different, like maybe I want to make it look like it's got um eight CPU cores. Oh man, if I'm a Bitcoin miner or I'm a, a Monero miner, like that eight cores, oh, that's going to be juicy. All I have to do is edit this file and change them. And I could change them to be Xeons um, of a different speed, or I could make it look like um, one of the AMD Threadripper systems with 32 or 64 cores and make the trap more enticing. Um, I can also, if I want, make entirely new folders with real files. And I could copy these off of a real system um, so that my honey trap looks more effective. So for instance, I could say um, make dir um, home, make dir home, Michael, VI home, Michael, passwords.txt. And then I could say all 
Why would I want to do that? Because that password now becomes a token, a honey token. And I can see if it's reused elsewhere. Does it show up in brute force attacks against my mail server? Um, so I can start dropping fake files to see if they steal the contents. And that was as easy as um, editing a text file. Calry actually does have a much more elaborate file system. And it's located in the share folder. And it's called, um, it uses a, a Python system called Pickle, which is a fake file system. And you can actually e extract this and then package it all up and it's done for performance reasons. Um, but in the share folder, we have a few more, more interesting things like text commands. So, you know, when I was typing certain commands, they generated real output. And there's two ways that that happens. One is, if all I care is that when the attacker types in the command into the into the honeypot, they always get the same output, well, I create a text command. And then whatever is in the text file, when they type the command, that's what they get as their output. So for instance, share calorie bin u limit. If they type in u limit, they will always see this output. If they type the mount command, they will always see this output. Now, this is makes it really easy for us to customize the honeypot to look like whatever we want. For instance, on the mount system, uh, one of my favorite tricks is to make it look like I'm mounting an NFS drive that's got, say, some corporate financial data and see if they start exploring it. Um, but there's a downside to these static text commands. Easy to edit, but it's easy for the hackers to profile them. And hackers really do create signatures to detect our honeypots. <clears throat> if you think about it, we're always worried about zero days in vulnerabilities in our systems. These honeypots are the zero days that hurt the hackers. And the more unique it is, the more likely they're going to hit <clears throat> something that they have no signature to detect. However, Cowrie's made it possible to create very dynamic commands. So if we take a look in the source folder, there is a command subfolder full of little Python scripts. Um, back in the day with Kippo, if I recall, some of these were actually shell scripts. I could be wrong. But you'll notice these curl, dd, wget, tar. These were commands that I could type in Cowrie as the attacker and get some action. So I tried to do a wget with a URL. Well, whenever I did that within the honeypot, it would actually run this Python program. And I could make a simple little script that generates whatever output I want the attacker to see. And it can actually interact with the real world. So for instance, I can let the attacker download files. And what this wget command and this curl command does is saves that copy in the varlib downloads folder. Um, but it also lets the attacker see the file name and pretends like it was really downloaded so that then if they want to run the tar command, the tar command generates output that looks real. But this allows us to isolate the attacker from the real data. They download their malware. They think they're interacting with it, but they're not. They're interacting with our Python scripts that could extract a little bit of data. Um, you could do all sorts of interesting things with this. For instance, you could have live response or active defense mechanisms in here so that when they download a piece of malware, you immediately throw it into a sandbox or generate a hash, add it to your block lists dynamically in your system just by modifying these. Or you could create a highly interactive system. So for instance, maybe what you wanted to do is make this look like a vulnerable IP camera. And maybe what you wanted to do 
we'll see um, how they distribute the Mariah botnet. In which case, you wouldn't care about most of these Unix commands. You would want to emulate the CLI of that IP camera, which might have a totally different set of commands, or it might not even be a bash command line. And you can totally do it. It's not even hard. You don't have to be a, a great Python programmer because these are tiny little scripts that minimum all you have to do is the parse the arguments that the hacker types in and then print some output. Oh my God, is that not easy? That's easy. Um, in addition to that, in the chair folder, um, we've got these architectures. So say you want to customize your um, Cowrie honeypot to look like a very specific type of Unix system or a specific piece of hardware. You want all of those commands like PS and CPU info to come out and looking like that flavor, like maybe it's OpenBSD. Um, maybe it's running on MIPS or ARM architecture. Um, a lot of these are really old. Like, okay, if you come across a PowerPC Linux system, um, please let me know um, because it probably belongs in a muse museum. But you run into ARM today and uh, even occasionally MIPS. Um, over the UFC uh, InfoSec Club this week, they were talking about how the U of A still teaches assembly on MIPS. I have very fond memories of Linux-based MIPS systems from the uh, early 2000s. But you can create your own flavors in here and just drop in those. There's also uh, a really cool thing where that process list is actually a JSON file. And you can um, put in a whole bunch of attributes of the running processes. So if the hacker types in normal commands to explore the processes, like list the full command line or the permissions or um, how much CPU it's consuming or how much RAM it's consuming, you just edit that JSON file and that's used as a data file um, that Calry shows. Com combining the HoneyFS is just a bunch of files and directories. The text commands, which are just text files that if he types in the command, he gets the output of that. And the Python scripts, with very little effort, you can make this emulate a real system that would be relevant to your environment and allow you to correct, uh, collect indicators of compromise and threat data that you could actually um, turn into actionable recommendations and intelligence. That is what honeypots are about. Okay. Uh, I think I've talked long enough. Um, I only went 15 minutes over my targeted one hour. Uh, questions. Do people have questions? Do you want me to explore more data? I wish there was more malware samples. Like that. That public key. Um, I think I know what that guy was doing. I think what the the reason why one of the downloads is a public key is I'd be willing to bet that when he breaks in, the first thing he does is adds it to the authorized key list in the SSH directory. So on a real Linux server, you'd ask the authorized key and he wouldn't have to log in with a password anymore. So Ryan asks... Uh, how well secured are Python commands for Cowry? If you realize you were on a honeypot, could you inject additional commands? That's a really great question. So if the code was badly written, then yeah, that would be a risk. Uh, Kippo and Cowry, which is, they're both part of the same evolution of the same piece of software, have been around for a really long time. Uh, I'm not aware of any of those incidents. Uh, I've run um, uh, 
Kippo and Cowrie servers for years at a time and not seen that kind of compromise. But if you wrote your own code, you could slip up and allow for command injections. So it is a possibility. Uh, there are some risks that are related though. So for instance, um, the attacker can download malware and we get a sample. Well, that's good. But if you don't put a limit on how big the download is, they could fill your hard drive or consume all your bandwidth. Another risk is they could get you in trouble by downloading something illegal or connecting to a website. And, you know, they're just connecting to a URL and we think it's for download, but a URL could actually be a transaction. So they could post like a death threat to some discussion board and then get you in trouble. And so there are a few little risks like that, but um, I've never seen that happen. It's one of the reasons to customize your honeypot so it's not easily detectable because if the attacker does know it's a honeypot, they might try to seek retribution for you being a clever good guy. Um, that said, there is a really cool component that wasn't in Cowrie the last time I played with it. And that is what's called the backend pool. So Cowrie, instead of emulating all these commands with these Python commands and text commands, it can actually proxy the SSH connection to a virtual machine. And, you, and they call it the backend pool because what happens is Cowrie creates a whole bunch of virtual machines dynamically so that you can have real interaction. Not a fake system, a real system, but one that gets torn down when it's done. Well, um, there is a vulnerability that Ben posted into our Discord um, that allows people to escape from containers and VMs on um, the Linux kernel. <laughs> Which is exactly how the backend pool in Calvary works. So if you were using that high interaction backend, Currently, if you don't upgrade your Linux kernel, they could be escaping and being on your system. Um, I always recommend that if you're going to run a honeypot, make sure it's in a secured segment where there is the only egress allowed is the egress that you want. Um, Derek asks, is there a image available for VMware? Um, No, there is a Docker container, but the way this works is you just install an Ubuntu VMware image, and then you um, clone the GitHub repository and follow a few simple commands. The reason why I didn't cover how to install it tonight is it's not hard, but it does involve a few very specific steps and depending on um, how you, what OS you install it on, those steps can be different. So you need to create a non-privileged user. Oh yeah, this a, a affects Ryan's question as well. When you install Calry, it doesn't run as root. It runs as a non-privileged user. And you have to do a couple steps like, um, it'll listen on port 2222 instead of 22, and you have to redirect 22 to that. Um, I would also, and Ryan said, is a Docker image? Yes, in fact. So right at the beginning of this chat, if you scroll all the way up, I posted a couple URLs to the documentation and to the GitHub. And um, the documentation has a section on Docker. Do not install Docker images from repositories that you don't trust. Some, if you download someone else's Cowrie Docker and it's not the official one, you could be downloading malware. And it's a real thing. Lots and lots of um, Docker images are Trojanized. So be, be wary. I, I would build my own Docker container from the Docker build file. It's pretty easy. Um, does it run on CentOS? It will run on anything. It will run on any Linux. It's just Python. Uh, but 
depending on the distribution you run it on, um, there will be different um, different easy steps to get all your Python requirements. So for instance, if I run it on Ubuntu, I can copy and paste some simple commands to get all of my Python installed. Or if I run it on CentOS or Fedora or Arc Linux or whatever, um, getting those Python requirements might be different. Now uh, they do make it easy because all the Python requirements are in a file called requirements.txt and whatever distribution you like to run on, you just need to make sure you get these versions of these Python things, and then it's just Python. So you can run it on anything. Um, yeah, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of CentOS. It's a Red Hat clone um, in a lot of commercial environments. That's what you get limited to, and it'll, it'll run just fine. Um, I have not run it in a, con a Docker container, and if you've watched my previous Tech Tuesdays, you'll be like, Michael, and, you know, um, A. Dunn's probably out there going, why not Windows Subsystem for Linux? You love Windows Subsystem for Linux. I might try that someday. The networking will be a pain. Um, yeah. Any more questions? Uh, look, I have a question for you guys, which is, um, would you want to see something more specific or in-depth about this? So one of the things about Cowrie that I haven't even touched that because um, Jason touched on it is it has built-in plugins to send its data to Elkstack, Splunk, uh, MongoDB. Um, it writes its logs in JSON as well as text. So uh, what most people do is they don't look at those log files that I was looking at. They literally send those off to an analytics system where they can search them, sort them, graph them and create dashboards. Um, I haven't played with that for some time, um, but um, I'd be into doing a future text Tuesday after I gather several months worth of data. And then we could do some experiments exploring that to see if there's any useful patterns that we could do. <laughs> yes, I do love Windows Subsystem for Linux. I am waiting for the GPU support to come out. So early next year, Windows Subsystem for Linux will support GPU acceleration. And then I can do machine learning on my graphics card, on my Windows system using Linux commands. Because <laughs> I like things complicated. Um, all right, I think I will wrap this up and I will... Um, just say that um, I think this is going to come back in some future uh, live streams because uh, within the cybersecurity librarian community, uh, we are starting a new project called O6, an open, uh, um, open source intelligence exchange. We don't know what we're doing yet. I got to talk to some people, but we are going to start to experiment with doing our own open source intelligence analysis um, and publication. And that overlaps with a bunch of other Tech Tuesdays that people in our community have done uh, with MISP, with threat intelligence gathering, and with analysis. Because with people in the community that want to do the non-technical analysis, which I'm very passionate about, and people who want to do gather indicators of compromise, and people who want to do threat actor profiles. And I think because we don't have anything in the community that provides that, and we need those people in our community, we should just start before we're ready and become the people that can do that. And I think a network of honeypots and a MISP server are great overlaps between what we're all doing in the community separately. So I'll say more about that in the future. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining me. Until next time, that's me.